when you start looking at the people who supposedly know it all, the brainiacs that are on the front page all the time and on TV all the time telling us about our cosmos, they're saying stuff like this in the documentary The Principle. How many of you guys have seen The Principle? If you have not, write it down. You need to watch it. Now, they don't, they're, not, they're not flat earthers. They still believe in the ball earth, but they are making a fantastic scientific case for geocentricity. And when I look at it, I'm like, great, that's the gateway drug to flat earth anyway. Go for it. <laughs> Become a geocentrist because you're only a little shove over from there. Because I'll tell you what, if, we, if geocentricity is true and heliocentricity is false, we've got to throw out everything we think we know anyway. Because everything we think we understand about the cosmos is built on the Copernican heliocentric model. And if that model is not true, we've got to start over anyway. That's why I'm, they should give me royalties, because I'm always, go watch the principle. Then come back, we'll talk some more. In that documentary, you have Michio Kaku saying, usually in science, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of ten, we call that horrible. We say something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of ten. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of ten to the 120th. That is one with 120 zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. They're admitting it. And if you want to see how bad it's gotten, check this out. The ancients viewed their world as a snow globe. It was essentially a flat earth, say a disc, covered by a dome. Uh, and we call this in English a firmament. And in the firmament is where all the stars and the planets were hung. Almost all ancient cultures believed their universe existed in a dome similar to this one. And they never questioned who created it. The ancients assumed that there was a god or gods responsible for the creation and the maintenance of the universe. The idea that God created the universe went largely unchallenged until the Middle Ages, when scientists made a sacrilegious suggestion based on their observations. The sun, not the earth, was at the center of the universe. It was a paradigm shift there is now another way to explain the naturally occurring phenomena around us, and this is science. Since the Middle Ages, scientists have developed sophisticated new theories about the enormity of the universe and our place in it. Theories that often have no room for God. Many phenomena have appeared mysterious or miraculous or magical. And then through the process of science, we've eventually understood them. Scientists gradually realize that the sun really is just one star among a multitude of stars in a gigantic galaxy having hundreds of billions of such stars. And all this was created in a big bang 13.7 billion years ago. But while scientific theories, observations, and experiments tell us where we are in the cosmos, they don't answer the eternal questions why we're here, and who, if anyone, created us. It sounds very laudable to, to, to teach the controversy, to teach both theories, but there aren't two theories. There's only one theory around. There's only one, one game in town as far as serious science is concerned. Of course, you get negative reactions from creationists, but who cares about creationists? They don't know anything. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? And, and anyway. We're Johnny Come Lately's. We live in the cosmic boondocks. We emerged from microbes and muck. Apes are our cousins. You don't believe that the Earth is round only if you're an astronaut. You don't believe Napoleon existed only if you're a historian. You believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. Evolution is also a demonstrated fact. The truth really is out there. It's not a matter of opinion. 
how many of you have heard that, you know, according to the theory of evolution, we share about 98% of our genetic makeup with chimpanzees? Have you heard that in school? You, have you ever heard how they came to that number? 98%? We've all just heard it, right? We share 98% of our genome with chimps. Okay, the video I'm about to show you is not from a Kent Hovind or a creationist. It's from somebody who believes in evolution, somebody who believes we came from chimpanzees, but actually acknowledging how we got the 98%. Check this out. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places or in reverse order? or broken up into pieces. Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections, a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. <laughs> but that's what passes for science. Does that sound completely absurd to you? Oh yeah, we just, you know, one point whatever, four billion letters, let's throw those out. Hey, we're 98% the same. What? That's insane. But that's in college level science books being passed off as fact. So uh, you believe it's liberating to uh, tell people that there is no God? I think a lot of people, when they give up God, feel a great sense of release uh, and freedom. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. What was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. Evolution is a fact. It's documented by science. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. Believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers such as God. Many, many people are extremely illogical. By the end of the 1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble, working with the large 100-inch telescope atop Mount Wilson outside Los Angeles, had established that our galaxy was only one of many galaxies in the universe. When we look out at other galaxies, on average, they're moving away from us. And those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast. And those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast. And of course, that makes us look like we're in the center of the universe. Such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, 
analogous in a sense to the ancient conception of a central earth. This hypothesis cannot be disproved, but it is unwelcome and would only be accepted as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. Therefore, we disregard this possibility. The unwelcome position of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable. Several decades ago, we found a problem, a problem so great that it was brushed under the carpet for many a decade. And this is the fact that galaxies spin too fast. In fact, 10 times too fast. By rights, the galaxy should fly apart. Therefore, scientists said that we have to have dark matter, a halo of matter that surrounds the galaxy and holds the galaxy together. And what have they discovered? Absolutely nothing. Zilch. What is a little bit perturbing is that after 50 years, we still haven't found what the dark matter is. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means they're harder to find than we thought. We look out in the universe and 85% of all the gravity that's out there has some mysterious unknown source. We add up all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the comets, the black holes, the dark clouds, everything out there that we can see, touch, smell, or taste. And it doesn't add up to give us the gravity that we see operating in this universe. So really we should be calling it the dark force because we don't know if it's made of matter. It could be a profound misnomer sending people off in thought directions that might not really be uh, the right path. So dark matter is just simply what we call this thing about which we know nothing responsible for 85% of the gravity of the cosmos. It is the longest standing unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. Dark matter, dark energy. Everything we know about the universe, what we're made of, galaxies, stars, planets, that's all right here. So, according to this chart, we are 96% stupid. So the problem with cosmology is that we keep inventing theories, uh, ad hoc theories, to try to explain the data, such as inflation, dark matter, dark energy, and so on, just to keep patching the theory up. There is a crisis in cosmology. Usually in science, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of 10, we call that horrible. We say something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of 10. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120. That is one with 120 zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. A very large number of universes, perhaps even an infinite number, could in principle exist in a vast hyperspace. We can understand the idea of hyperspace by comparing it to a mug of beer. beer. The beer mug would be the hyperspace and the bubbles would be these individual universes. The bubbles in a beer mug are all physically about the same. But suppose they span a range of properties. Some of them might have carbon and oxygen and stars and gravity. And others don't. We would be in one of the ones that leads to a rich, complex universe culminating with life as we know it. If there are an infinite number of other universes, the fine-tuning that seems to be present in ours isn't an example of God's plan, but rather the law of statistics. Most of these universes wouldn't naturally develop in ways that fostered intelligent life. But a few would. So then the explanation for the specialness of the universe is that we are winners in a gigantic cosmic lottery. It stands to reason that we couldn't be living and discussing this in a universe that was hostile to life. Only the bio-friendly ones get populated with thinking beings. Having a multitude of universes is actually quite a simple and natural consequence of some of the most favored models for the birth and early evolution of our universe. It's kind of like stars and planets. As long as you have the capacity to make one, it's easy to make lots of them. Oh, really? <laughs> wow! Beer mug hyperspace multi-bubble verse. Really? Mm, beer. <laughs> Seriously? They're farting out beer bubble universes.
<laughs> okay, that's what they're doing. Hey, I got an idea. Burp. Yep, multi beer bubble universe. And they call that science and they make fun of us. Really? Yeah, I'm not going to take that from them anymore. I'm not going to sit here and let people who think they came from monkeys out of a beer bubble universe ridicule me for <laughs> looking into what I'm looking into and considering, you know, a possibility. If you guys can think about beer bubble universes, then I can think about a snow globe. Fair enough? Okay, let's move on. <coughs> How completely bankrupt is cosmology? After you've seen their own words, you, you've seen and heard them. They're, making, they're pulling stuff out of their butt. They're having beer bubble fart parties. <laughs> Ooh, there's another universe. Let's write that up in a paper and peer review it. Okay. <laughs> there. I agree. That's about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to re-edit this and like put Homer coming. Because <laughs> that's what science has been reduced to. And at least they're admitting it. 10 to the 120th power. That's how far off we are in our cosmology. Whoa. That's just outrageous. And, and Nikola Tesla saw it coming. You know, today's scientists in his day have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure that has no relation to reality. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.